Good afternoon, everybody. I think now we can get started. Welcome this afternoon. It's great to see everybody here. Um, and it's great to have those who are on the live stream um, watching this vir virtually. Uh, my name is Sarah Rosen. I'm the Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences here at Georgia State University. I wanna thank all of our students, faculty and staff and friends who have joined us in person and virtually for the college's 22nd Helen Ingram Plummer Lecture in 2022. The Plummer Lecture is the college's endowed lecture, allowing us to feature prominent scholars and public figures who have made notable contributions to their fields and to greater society. The lecture was endowed in 1999 in honor of the late Helen Ingram Plummer, who was a strong supporter of the arts in Atlanta over decades. She was the mother of the Pulitzer Prize winning poet, James I. Merrill, and the former spouse of Merrill Lynch founder, Charles E. Merrill. She counted among her friends, artistic greats, such as George Gershwin, Charlie Chaplin, Catherine Hepburn, and Gloria Swanson. In past years, the Palmer Lecture has brought to campus well-known figures such as award-winning author, Carol Anderson, Nobel laureate, Walter Cohn, and Pulitzer Prize winning journalist, Susan Faludi. This year, we are thrilled to have author, professor, academic leader, and humanist, Dr. Dana Williams deliver the 2022 Plummer Lecture. But before we introduce Dr. Williams, I wanna give a quick plug to our co-sponsor, the Humanities Research Center. In particular, I wanna thank the director, Denise Davidson, for helping to organize this year's lecture. Our Humanities Research Center supports scholarship in the humanities and social sciences and hosts a fantastic lecture series aimed at a very broad audience. After a two-year pandemic hiatus, we look forward to resuming the lecture series in April with funding from the Georgia Humanities and the National Endowment for the Humanities. An announcement of the lecture series will be shared within the next week. At this time, I'd like to invite to the stage Dr. Elizabeth West to introduce tonight's speaker. Dr. West is the John B. and Elena Diaz Verson Amos Distinguished Chair in English Letters here at Georgia State University, and that's a mouthful. <laughs> Her research and published scholarship focus on African, Africana, and Caribbean literary expressions of spirituality, particularly in women. Dr. West is a true leader among the faculty who has provided leadership on campus in numerous roles. Currently, she serves as academic director of the college's Center for Studies on Africa and its diaspora. Dr. West's work through the center includes, among other things, a three and a half year project funded by the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation to establish an intersectional studies collective focused on the American South. I look forward to seeing her project take off with future guest lectures, symposia, workshops, roundtable discussions, and a new podcast. So please welcome Elizabeth West to the stage. Thank you, Dean Rosen. And uh, I'm still working on that title too. <laughs> uh, good evening, everyone. It is an honor to introduce our invited guests for the 2022 Plummer Lecture. Dr. Dana A. Williams is Dean of the Graduate School at Howard University and former chair of Howard's Department of English. Dr. Williams has a long record of extraordinary accomplishments in the academy. This includes her published works, her grant supported endeavors and her professional leadership. In the interest of time, I will offer a few examples to give you a sense of her reach and impact in the world of literature and language and that of higher education. 
Dr. Williams is the author of the first and only book link study of novelist Leon Forrest, that work entitled In the Light of Likeness Transformed the Literary Art of Leon Forrest. Uh, and that was published at Ohio State University Press. She has co-edited uh, August Wilson and Black Aesthetics. And that was uh, in partnership with um, the uh, August Wilson scholar, Sandra Shannon. Her edited works also include African-American humor, ivory, I mean, irony and satire, Ishmael Reed, satirically speaking, conversations with Leon Forrest and contemporary African-American fiction, new critical essays. In addition to her book projects, Dr. Williams has a record of articles that include publications in leading academic journals and op-ed and her op-ed writings in more public facing venues. In 2016, Dr. Williams was nominated by then President Barack Obama and subsequently appointed member of the National Council on the Humanities. She is the past president of the Association of the Departments of English, former chair of the Modern Language uh, Association's Black American Literature and Culture uh, Forum and member of the Executive Council. She is on the board of the Hurston Wright Foundation, the Center for Black Literature, and a member of the board of directors for the American Council of Learned Societies. She is presently second vice president in line of ascendancy uh, uh, to president of the Modern Language Association. Although her position as president of the Toni Morrison Society hinges on a globally recognized figure, it is Dr. Williams' past presidency of the College Language Association the oldest and largest black founded professional organization for studies in languages and literatures that weigh most profoundly for me. It is in this role and her ongoing service to the organization that I have witnessed Dr. Williams commitment to the development of not only junior faculty, but also both undergraduate and graduate students. It is a mission that she takes on for the organization members in her own institution, as well as those from other institutions. I am particularly familiar with her men mentorship of two GSU graduate students, Shana, former Shauna Curlew and Timothy Lyle, who are now in the academy making their own mark. It is in her capacity as a specialist in contemporary African-American literature that Dr. Williams will address this evening's audience, uh, uh, this evening's audience in. Her talk, Tony at Random, is anchored in her forthcoming book on Toni Morrison. The importance of Williams' book is its recognition of the inherent connection of Morrison's work as editor for Random House uh, to her larger mission of bringing black literary voices to the press and to the public. I hand the stage to Dr. Williams at this point as I can offer no summary that will compare to what she'll give you firsthand. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you so much to Dr. Rosen uh, for really just ushering in the spirit with which I think we will all participate in this conversation this afternoon. I thank you to Dr. West for the introduction and I'll add that my executive assistant is actually a Georgia State graduate as well. I'm Jamisha Relaford, um, whom I stole away from the English department without um, any sense of regret whatsoever. <laughs> she was directing the writing center and um, indicated um, and a faculty member there and said, Dr. Williams, I'm burned out. I can't do this. I think I got to get out of the academy. And I was like, well, would you do this other thing in the academy? And she agreed. Um, so I really appreciate it. And the ties to Georgia State are long in large part based on the work that you do and the way that you connect me to incredible students. 
Um, and then, of course, I want to say thank you to the Plumber Lecture Organizing Committee, especially um, Dr. Davidson, who has been hospitable to me from the moment of invitation. Um, and she has also been incredibly patient. I do a number of things well. Email is not one of them. <laughs> so I responded when I could. So again, I appreciate the patience. I also want to thank you all for coming. I understand that this is uh, one of uh, a few in-person events that you have all been gathered together. So thank you for breathing the space and thank you to our virtual audience. And then finally, I have to say, or actually two more. Um, thank you, of course, to those HIP students who I met um, for lunch. I mean, incredible projects, really excited about it. Um, got to shout out my former student, Jasmine, who is like really incredible. And then my CLA and Toni Morrison Society colleagues. Thank you all so much for coming. I see Carolyn Denard, founder of the Toni Morrison Society um, here. And then um, there is this collaboration too between CLA and the Morrison Society. Um, my talk today draws upon a number of chapters in my forthcoming book on Toni Morrison's editorship at Random House Publishing Company. The book shares its title with the short title of this lecture, Toni at Random. I'm not much better with titles than I am with email, I confess, but I was quite proud of myself with the initial one I came up with for this book. It was corny, but clever. I had the good fortune of interviewing Ms. Morrison a number of times and exchanging emails with her from time to time about the project. And the only time she explicitly gave me advice about the book was when I shared the first title with her. And people would ask me often whether I felt pressured to uh, make changes in the book based on her influence or things that she was interested in. And I can say, um, except for the fact that again, she was very clear about like how encompassing the book would be even as I was resistant, Otherwise, she was not influential or didn't push the issue at all. But with this one, it was at a New Year's Eve party at Eleanor Trailers that I said, um, she said, how are things going? And I said, slow but steady. I have a title, excitedly. And she said, let's hear it. And I said, the house that Tony built at random. You know, like it's a house and it's random house. And I was like, this is like really clever. And she said, too long. <laughs> Pause. Tony at random. We both nodded as if turning it over in our heads and then we both mouthed it, Tony at random. So I stuck with it. The challenge of titles was an inside joke of sorts between us. She knew that I had spent every spare moment I had in the Random House archives at Columbia. There among those thousands of pages of paper was evidence of aha moments and heated arguments alike, all related to the title of books and other things. The right title could be the difference between people picking up a book they hadn't heard of or ignoring it, between a book doing well or going out of print too quickly. So she worked really hard at getting titles right, sometimes to the chagrin of the authors she edited who had other titles in mind. But let me stop, I'm getting ahead of myself. When I first began to work on this project almost 20 years ago, the overwhelming majority of Morrison scholarship ignored her work as editor. The late remarkable scholar and human being Cheryl Wall was one of the few exceptions. I speak her name and invoke her memory and her presence in this moment. There are any number of reasons for the neglect of Morrison's editorship in terms of scholarship. The release of the film, Toni Morrison, The Pieces I Am, brought some much needed attention to her role as editor. But even the film, like so much scholarship on Morrison, focuses on the ways she deconstructs, disrupts, rejects, and modifies what we have come to accept as the norm, mainly through her fiction. Far less attention is paid to her essays and her other works, and even less attention is paid to the role she played as editor, in, as an editor in crafting a movement and helping to define a literary aesthetic. The most widely accepted trends in recent African-American literary scholarship and theory are at least partly responsible for the frameworks or lenses through which we have become accustomed to reading the period in contemporary texts and to characterizing Morrison's significance to African-American and American letters. As Adolph Reed argues in Tradition and Ideology in Black Intellectual Life, contemporary Black scholarship after 1980, quote, reflects an outlook that in its focus on delineating a distinctive and coherent tradition in Afro-American thought smooths out important elements in the constitution of black intellectual and cultural history. 
This outlook arises from and reinforces an ideological current within the post-segregationist Black era petite bourgeoisie that is troubling because of its fundamentally conservative and depoliticizing effects on Black American intellectual life, end quote. Notably, Reed, a political scientist by training, argues that it is the prominence of literary studies in contemporary African-American scholarship, its text-based notions of a distinctive and coherent tradition in Afro-American thought, and its corresponding idealistic and at times a historical approach to intellectual history that contributes to contemporary scholarship's tendency to blur the distinction between cultural history and the history of social and political thought in such a manner that allows the former to substitute at times wrongly for the latter. A quiet disinterest in the various dimensions of literacy as a means of learning and knowing that influence works produced by certain African-American writers that are not always related to the books that we see is perhaps another reason there is so little scholarship on Morrison's editorship. Perhaps now more than ever, ours is a culture that tends to focus on the author as the producer and on the text as a finished product, seldom on the journey to publication or on the editors. The absence of sufficient conversations about the role of editors historically in literature and critical histories of literary traditions among other places makes this point. We know major authors, we teach major authors, but we don't know the editors. Jesse Fawcett is perhaps the lone exception in African-American literature. And something in us believes that we needn't know this or that we shouldn't know it. As W. Lawrence Hogue argues in Discourse and the Other, the production of the Afro-American text, editors, publish, quote, editors, publishers, critics, and reviewers function as a kind of conduit for many of the established cultural, ideological, and intellectual preferences. They certify those texts that speak the discourse better, that conform to the established literary standards and criteria, end quote, and they exclude those texts that do not conform in subject or perspective. In this Black Lives Matter era, we've become a little bit more deliberate about the role publishers, critics, and reviewers play in the culture that we consume. But by and large, the editor remains the outlier. Unlike critics and reviewers who gained their greatest influence over a text after its publication, editors and publishers ultimately control which texts are actually published. Editorships, almost all of which have been reserved for white professionals, have shaped African-American literary movements from the earliest days until the contemporary moment. And while all of the books Morrison edited were not written by African-American authors, her editorship was undeniably one that shapes the period in African-American literature immediately following the Black arts movement, and one that in terms of its volume and its influence is without peer. The third reason Morrison's editorship has gone largely unexamined is related to the first and the second yet distinct from these. The sheer amount of time and research it takes to explore an editorship that expands over 20 years is not for the faint of heart, especially when scholarly trends exalt shorter, single authored books that make a neat, even if discursive argument. A meaningful examination of Morrison's editorship would be anything but short and neat. In fact, such a book should be characterized by all of the messiness of the archive and the tensions inherent in African-American literature. A looming question about Morrison's editorship in particular explores how she negotiates a mainstream publisher's efforts to participate in on the one hand and suppress on the other, the radicalism of the black arts movement and its fallout. All the while folding a resident black aesthetic into the mainstream. Almost paradoxically then, Morrison sits comfortably at the center and on the margins at the same time. As an editor, her task, at least in part, was to capture and print the lingering aesthetic of the performance-based Black arts movement and irony in and of itself. Her work as editor is undoubtedly influenced by her experiences in academia, the profession she left before joining Random House. Indisputably, she brought into print at a mainstream publishing house a notable number of counter institutional cultural workers. In a public remembrance of Toni Morrison as his teacher at Howard University posted a few days after her death, critic Houston Baker shed some light on this seeming contradiction. Rehearsing an exchange between his teacher, Morrison, and fellow student, Stokely Carmichael, 
later Kwame Ture, Baker noted that Morrison's indulgence of Carmichael Ture's interruption of her teaching of William Faulkner's The Bear. At one point during the class, a loud, mellifluous voice commanded, quote, Black people in the United States are being beaten and dying. The capitalist system is corrupt. Why are we reading this racist old man who said he would defend Mississippi against any civil rights intervention with a shotgun in hand, end quote. According to Baker, Morrison, quote, without so much as a small readjustment of her professorial posture answered, Mr. Carmichael, scripture tells us there's a time and place for every occasion. For today, the time is reserved for Faulkner's masterpiece, The Bear. Please let us continue in season with Faulkner's astonishing creative achievement. As Baker's telling makes clear, even before publishing an interesting mix of ideologically radical nonfiction and distinctive literary texts at a mainstream house, Morrison was unfazed by what others might deem a startling contradiction. Of course, she would go on to assist with the publication of her former student's autobiography, Stokely Speaks, a time and a place for everything indeed. Here you see images from, of course, the documentaries, uh, Toni Morrison's The Pieces I Am, but then you also see the image from that film that shows some of the books that she edited. In spite of turning our attention to things, or in the spirit rather, of turning our attention to things less talked about, I want to focus today on the three Black women whose poetry Morrison published and use their author-editor relationship to examine the intersection of art and archive as the instructive space where voicings and silences collide, where past and future, uh, future present, as a matter of fact, where past and future present understandings are in dialogue, where the singular and the collective converge and where oblivion and awareness oscillate. So the three, the three writers are Barbara Chase Rabot, Lucille Clifton, and June Jordan. Dear Barbara, I astounded myself by getting some overwhelming support for your book at sales presentation yesterday. I went in hoping for a 1500 print run and well, I was brilliant. Now I have a very severe problem. How to get all those thousands to actually buy your book? If it comes back after we advance it, I will slit my throat. That's a letter from Toni Morrison to Toni, um, to Barbara Chase Rabot upon the um, securing a contract for her work. Morrison's boldness in publishing 5,000 copies of Barbara Chase Rabot's from Memphis and Peking, the first volume of poetry she published as an editor and the first that Chase Rabot wrote was a sign of her growing comfort as an editor who was willing to take risks and to chart her own path. No doubt Morrison was inspired by the fact that she had finished her second novel, Sula, and based on early reviews of that novel, it would be a critical success, affirming her position as a first-rate writer. She was aware early on that her clout as a well-regarded novelist buttressed her authority as an editor. She had the good fortune, too, of being at a house, a firm, that did not have to take books to a committee for approval. Rather, an editor simply had to convince the editor-in-chief to agree to have the firm buy a book. For a novice trade editor trying to build her stable of writers, this fact was crucial. It was even more significant when you consider the fact that Morrison moved from the textbook department at a small firm that Random House bought to trade books to the unit of Little Random without having to endure the years of grunt work characteristic of an assistant or associate editor with aspirations of someday being a senior editor. Morrison met Chase Rabot almost by happenstance. Both were at a party by Lynn, that was hosted by Lynn Nesbitt, Morrison's literary agent at the time. As Chase Rabot recalls, a mutual friend of hers and Nesbitt's approach Nesbitt and incredulously remarked to everyone with an earshot, you'll never guess what Barbara has done. She's written a collection of poems. By then, Chase Rabot was already a well-regarded sculptor, but she had no formal training as a writer and had not even taken a literature course in college. After Chase Rabot shared a copy of the poems with Nesbitt, Nesbitt thought they were good enough and invited Morrison to read them. Morrison liked them right away. As she was apt to do for manuscripts she admired, she wasted no time proposing and getting approval for the book and having a contract drawn up and sent to Nesbitt, who then became Chase Rabot's agent. The advance was beyond modest, $500 on signing, 
and $500 on delivery of the manuscript. Reluctantly, Random House embraced the prospect of successfully publishing an, own, an unknown public poet, but only if the firm could minimize its liability by offering such a negligible advance. Chase Rabot was born in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania and educated at Temple University's Tyler School of Fine Arts and at Yale, where she had earned a degree in design and architecture. Shortly thereafter, she moved to France where she earned an international reputation as a sculptor whose work was influenced by classical European artists and African artistic practices. Chase Rabot exhibited her work in major galleries in Paris, Boston, New York, Berkeley, Philadelphia, Germany, and Belgium in solo shows and then among collections. Here are a couple of images of some of her work. Her photographic essays had appeared in Harper's, Vogue, and Essence, and her sculptures had been reviewed in the New York Times and Art News and in art form. Logically, Morrison leaned on Chase Rabot's fame as an artist instead of trying to situate her exclusively as a poet in her own right. Part of Morrison's, quote, brilliance at the sales conference was her decision to have Chase Rabot described as an extraordinarily beautiful Black sculptress who is an exciting, highly promotable personality. Her poetry is tough, fibrous poetry reflecting her world and her extraordinary perceptions. And this is an image of Barbara Chase Rabot um, on Ebony. And she was actually the only visual artist who had ever been on the cover of Ebony. Having successfully presented the book at the sales presentation in October, 1973, Morrison began to focus on publicity for the book. First on the list of promotional work was a book party. Ironically though, Chase Rabo was reluctant, reluctant to participate in a book party and said so immediately. She was completely resistant to reading live at a party alone. She and Morrison tossed around ideas about having others read with Chase Rabo, having her record readings in advance and play them in different rooms if they were able to secure a museum as host and even having Roberta Flack accompany Chase Rabo as she read. While Morrison had counted on Chase Rabot's personality and good looks to help sell the book, for Chase Rabot, the book was to sell exclusively on its merits. She desperately wanted to avoid the fate of artists who, quote, tap dance for prizes and coverage. When she lamented that even coveted things like the Yale Prize, quote, has no meaning because its value is blurred because of its commercial val value, Morrison shot back. I don't understand what you're saying about holding a firm line between the work and publicity, Morrison said, quote, I hope you're right that people who like the work will do things for it without being asked that will relieve us entirely of doing anything at all other than manufacturing it. But it is probably not a good idea for us to take that risk. We have to think of all sorts of anonymous people walking into a bookstore and wanting to buy the book for some reason. One reason I can give them is that they have heard of or read about it. I must also try to get booksellers to put it on their shelves. And they will do that for one of two reasons. Random House says so, or they too have heard about it. So what is it that a, but publicity? This is a commercial house historically unenchanted with 500 slim volumes of profound poetry that languish in stock rooms, end quote. Having fought hard to get Random House to agree to underwrite a book party, Morrison was frustrated by Chase Rabot's hesitancy on the one hand and annoyed by her suggestion on the other that Morrison asked two of Chase Rabot's friends who were, quote, experts about such things on the other. And so, of course, part of what Morrison was thinking, if they're experts, what am I? The compromise was a party that would be hosted by Nesbitt and her husband, Richard Gilman, at the couple Central Park West Department on May 23rd in 74. Part of Chase Rabot's anxiety, she ultimately admitted to Morrison, was her husband Mark's disdain for self-promotion. Mark, quote, Mark is pathologically against personal publicity, she wrote. He thinks one should become famous, like he did, by sitting on a sand dune in the Sahara or in a rice paddy in North Vietnam. So I'm fighting on two fronts. First, my own natural tendency to shy away and fuss about the whole thing. And then Mark. Fortunately, Morrison and Chase Rabot had gotten to know each other well quickly after Morrison visited Chase Rabot in France that summer with her boys in tow. They'd spent a week working on the book while their children played together. So they developed a rapport that could withstand the many conflicts that arose as production of the book unfolded. Morrison writes, I think it's, um, 
these are a couple of the images of based on some of what I read here, where you see Chase Rabo talking about the mediocre book. But then once they're going back and forth about the publicity, um, Morrison, here's the letter from Chase Rabo saying, I don't want to do this publicity. And Morrison's response, your insanity is so interesting. Not at all like madness. To assuage Chase Rabot's fears about reading alone, she continued to insist that her voice was too soft, too low and too timid. Morrison finally agreed to read with her. Be assured that your editor will attend, you, uh, giving you, and attend giving you moral support. And I am not totally turned off by the idea of reading with you as a sort of anonymous editor who admittedly has worked intimately with the work. It would compliment, not distract from the poetry. Also, I do it well. If, however, by that time, I am truly famous as a consequence of my new book's publication in January, she's talking about Sula here, then you may as well have Miss Fleck. So go ahead and ask Lynn and hope that Roberta is free. She closed the letter with sentimentality and snark. Love you, girl, and fuck the sand dunes. No doubt she was responding to Mark's sentiments about the publicity and the way they left Chase Rabot feeling unsure of herself. The publication or the pre-publication tussles were not limited to publicity and to the book party. They also had ruminating exchanges about the design of the book. In early fall, Morrison sent Chase Rabot a copy of the preliminary design, noting that they were using Electra for the type and Weiss initials for the title. The copy edit team also had questions about the turnover lines, but Morrison agreed to wait until the manuscript was in galleys to address the problems. In response, Chase Rabot had a list of things she thought needed to be changed. Quote, my feeling is the following, that the designer didn't read the book and thought, a classy French lady who loves to write poetry, don't you think so? Although I really wanted to keep out of it, I spent seven hours looking at at least 3,000 book covers in three American bookstores in Paris. The poetry covers are the worst. I found two covers I liked, one Fire in the Lake and the other The Savage God. After about 30 tries, and I did try to work without the framework of the designer's layout, it didn't work. I have come up with the enclosed layout, which I think is superb. I didn't think I would come up with something I like as much. If you like it, fight for it, end quote. Additionally, Chase Rabot wanted the fleur-de-lis motif changed, arguing that it was too complicated and too floral. She wanted a new type, one that was sexier and stronger, quote, more American and more mysterious than the original. The word and should be dropped from the title and replaced with an ampersand to highlight the relationship and juxtaposition between the words Peking and Memphis. After all, Chase Rabot noted, she was a fallen graphic designer. So the Random House designer would understand, she mused. Morrison's response was quick-witted. Perhaps Chase Rabo had gone to such great lengths to have the cover adjusted according to her design when the copy Morrison sent was for the title page. It wasn't for the cover at all. <laughs> Still, Morrison took the opportunity to address Rabot's, Chase Rabot's assumption that the designer did not know the book. Quote, we talked about every detail of your book, Barbara. I never worked with a designer who was such a perfectionist. I think he can switch ornaments, but he chose the one he did from a Chinese silk screen pattern, which he showed me because I thought it was not Eastern enough. So much for Sino-French artistic sources. After I have spoken to the designer and tell him that you belong to his guild, I'll watch for the convulsions, wait for his recovery, then propose a title change, end quote. In response to Chase Rabot's query about how they might handle front matter, the people she wanted to thank, especially Morrison query, query. Will you want a dedication page as well as an acknowledgement page? Sometimes both are included. The latter being to Honeypot, without whose encouragement this book certainly would have done nothing. Or your thanks too is unusual at the end, but okay if you want it, if we have a page that does in fact announce the end of the book. Morrison's artful to honeypot, without whose encouragement this book was certainly done. Notice she said was certainly done. Without whose encouragement this book was certainly done was of course in reference to Mark, who in Morrison's estimation seemed less than enthusiastic about his wife's latest adventure. At one point, the tension about Mark's and her so-called friend's interventions was so thick that Morrison asked Chase Rabot point blank, did it ever occur to you 
that all the people advising you against my professional suggestions want your book to fail. When Morrison sent Chase Rabot the jacket proofs for the book, already high tensions finally came to a head. Morrison chose a picture of Chase Rabot with a sculpture for the front and another picture of Chase Rabot for the back. The silver and black color scheme, along with the images, were meant to convey this aesthetic and the sense of elegance. But Chase Rabot saw the choice differently. Quote, I find the dust jacket slick and over merchandised and for no good reason and to the detriment of the poems, she wrote. I especially object in the strongest way to two, repeat, two photos back and front. This is unheard of and really too much. The reaction here, and she names people who are reacting, is negative in that it becomes another black book, which is not the case, and a look at a black girl book. The whole feeling is vaguely sexist, Hollywood, racist, and exploitive, and a bit of dialogue to get you out of that healthy, uh, to get you out of the mentality of white publishing would have turned the tone into something good for both of us, end quote. Morrison's response was measured in matter of fact. I don't understand you. Why did you send us 36 pictures if we weren't supposed to use them <laughs> on the jacket or wherever? What did you think we were going to do with them? Seven calls and two telegrams have been placed to you with no response, but now the urgency regarding publicity, not the judgment about jacket covers, no author tells me what to do in that area. If you want an anonymous, plain, uneventful, recessive jacket, you should have never come to this publisher. The only time that works is when the poet is very well known as a poet. You are not. The purpose of the jacket is to make people pick it up, find the lid, and hopefully open the book. The acid test is on the pages. Remove it and your book will die in every bookstore in this country. You have the opportunity to transfer to some people some beauty and sublicence and some sensibility. Take a chance, end quote. Morrison did not bother to respond to the insinuation that her imagination had been overtaken by the white publishing world. She had learned to maneuver so quickly and so well. Her commitment to making the publishing industry bend toward her intentions as a black writer and an editor, at least as she saw it, was beyond dispute. Despite their evolving disagreement, Morrison continued to try to get attention for the book. While the collection was inspired by Chase Rabot's child travels abroad, from Memphis and Peking explored historical things beyond places she had visited and connected personal, familial, and communal experiences with world history. The final two sections of the book, Peking and White Porcelains, continue to use the sensual language that really characterized the look Morrison had given to the cover. In poems like Flying a Kite, If One Sets One's Foot, and ponies, the shape of the poem on the page attempted to simulate the themes of the poems. The reader's eye must help do the work of imagining. Everything about the collection should be visual. Chase Rabot closed the collection with a poem titled An Almost Full Moon. It is as strong as any poem in the collection and it turns on the idea that something has been missed, something that should not be missed. Here are a couple of lines from the poem. A perfectly respectable mathematical formula that doesn't come out right at all. My heart squeezed in the horror of some fundamental step ignored in the beginning, some primary rule forgotten in the haste to get on with it. The poem ends symbolically in tragedy with the hot chalk of murder screeching across the blackboard. In many ways, the poem captures at least one part of Chase Rabot's vision of herself as a deconstructionist. It also connected her to the larger artistic vision of herself as one interested in and committed to exploring ambivalence and complexities. Despite the promotional, book for the, uh, promotional push for the book, it received minimum reviews, except for in places like Choice, Library Journal, Kirkus, and Booklist. All of the reviews were favorable, but it did not seem to matter. In the end, the book did not sell well and got too little critical attention from the people in places that mattered. When Chase Rabot made the appeal for a second push of publicity, Morrison conceded that advertising and promotion money, even if counterintuitively, was reserved for books that were, had sales that were encouraging. Quote, had my own judgment 
had my own better judgment been executed, we would have printed less the first time around. The obstacles I anticipated in sales proved to be too strong." End quote. In Morrison's opinion, there were three paths to success for a book, her book in particular. The first was the general poetry market, but Chase Rabot was not an established name, so access to that market was limited. The second was the woman writer angle, which was not available to Chase Rabot because the theme of women in love persisted in some of the poems. The beauty and integrity of the poems were of less consequence, Morrison suggested, than were the sexual politics, which meant the women's movement readers who were the biggest readers and very influential in poetry and in publishing were put off by Chase Rabot, especially a poem she had written about Gloria Steinem. The third was the black market and Chase Rabot had resisted that and may not have received it anyway, even if she had agreed to it. With these three paths closed, along with a lack of reviews in key places and complete dissolution of the shows the publicity team had arranged, left the book modestly reviewed and not even bids for the remainders. Fortunately, Morrison and Chase Rabot's friendship persisted even as their professional relationship ended, but not before Morrison advised Chase Rabot that the idea she had for a book on Sally Hemings would never do well as an epic poem or using the diary format as Chase Rabot had proposed and insisted. Years later, Chase Rabot conceded and shifted the genre to traditional historical fiction as Morrison had suggested, but it would be years later and it would be Jacqueline Kennedy Onassis at Viking, not Morrison at Random House, who would be the editor to bring Sally Hemings to life in 1979. The same year, and I can promise you the next two are not as long as this one. I got a little carried away. I had just finished my interview with um, Barbara Chase Rabot on Zoom when I was writing this section, so it's a little more detailed than some of the others. The same year from Memphis and Peking is released, Morrison published Lucille Clifton's An Ordinary Woman. Random House had published Lucille Clifton's Good Times and Good News About the Earth, and both books had done well. While Morrison had been in touch with Clifton before to provide promotional commentary for Tony K. Bambara's Gorilla My Love, Natalie Lehman Hawk, Alice Mayhew, and Nan Talese had been Clifton's editors for the first two collections. Morrison admired Clifton's poetry, so when Talese, who had taken over from Mayhew, left Random House in 1971, and moved to Simon and Schuster, Perry Morrison and Clifton seems like a logical and natural fit. When Morrison and Clifton first began working together, Clifton was actually focusing on a project that would later be published as Generations, a memoir, a book about her family's history. The two women met first in the fall of 1973, and Morrison began her work as Clifton editors, Clifton's editor in earnest. Following their meeting in Morrison's office, Morrison expressed her excitement about the new poems Clifton's agent had sent. I have read all of the new poems Marilyn sent and they are so good. Very different, the feel of the collection from the other two. It's not just content, it's the what? Fabric, I guess, or tone, mellow. Less of the acid in good times, less of the outrage in earth. Mind you, you covered that acid in comfort, but it was there anyway, end quote. Morrison went on to suggest a few titles for the collection since Clifton was um, ambivalent, um, ambivalent about what to call the book. Her first recommendation was In My Own Season because the book finished with what she described as a very strong coming of age thread. She also offered as alternatives, The Woman Jar and Thought Places, both phrases from poems in the collection. In the end, they decided on an ordinary woman. Lines taken from the final poem in the book Morrison had referred to when she initially suggested that they title the book In My Own Season. With few exceptions, Morrison's editing of Clifton's poems was light. Clifton had a poem titled, I Am a Black Woman, for instance, quote, there must be 800 of these, Lucille, meaning poems <laughs> with the black woman title. Morrison wrote. So she, she suggested calling it, and I am not done yet, which was the first line of the poem in draft. In its published version, Clif Clifton shifted the first line to the title, dropped the conjunction and, and began the poem with the line, as possible as yeast, 
as imminent as bread. The poem to Miss Anne, Morrison noted, worked marvelously, but please delete the fourth verse. You don't need it. The three other images are thunderous and should not lead up to Little Rock spit. The other verbs are watched, walked, handed, very civilized, very poisonous. Spit, well, no. Clifton did publish the poem with the fourth stanza, but without the vitriol of the original one. In the poem, Miss Anne is a stand-in for a white woman who through the years has taken full advantage of her, match, her mismatched relationship with black woman. I will have to forget your face when you watched me breaking in the fields, missing my children. I will have to forget your face when you watched me carry your husband's stagnant water. I will have to forget your face when you handed me your house to make a home. And you never called me sister. Then you never called me sister. And it was only, it is, and it has only been forever. And I will have to forget your face. For Morrison and Clifton evidently agreed, the first three stanzas, stanzas did the work of being righteously dismissive, poisonous in fact, without reducing the poem speaker to the incivility of the white women who spit at the children in Little Rock. Quote, Little Rock pulls the poem out of the ages into the newspapers, Morrison argued, end quote. The new stanza, in contrast, adds a final blow, making clear that the reality of a shared humanity remained unacknowledged, but only by the least humane ones. Some of the poems were weaker than others, Morrison advised. And at least three of these poems were removed from the collection. A poem Clifton called Jeribu had too little power in Morrison's estimation. Sunflowers was too greeting card. And all of us are all of us with the exception of one line sounded like everybody else's poem. When she felt strongly about a suggestion or she did not think it rose to the level of revision, Clifton declined to make these changes, but even without the changes Morrison avowed, the poems were sheer dynamite. The difference between Clifton's success and Chase Rabot's, in terms of their both being black women who published slim volumes of poetry in 1974, can be explained at least in part in two ways. Clifton was an established poet for one thing, the other is she had the benefit of a black reading audience. Accordingly, she did not need white women's book clubs to sell books, which also meant that she could be critical of the ways white women upheld racism without fear of being shut out by them. She was free to explore the full range of being a black woman, an ordinary one, she teased. The Kirkus review of the collection completely misread this ordinariness as lacking accomplishment. They called the book Poetry in a Minor Key and described it as, quote, genuine but tepid. The choice review, contrastingly, seemed to get the poetry's complexity. Quote, these poems are deceptive, easy to read. They come back later with intense meaning, end quote. The opening line in Salem brings all of these things together, a critique of silence about racism, the difference between black and white women's feelings about feminism, the layers of complexity and the deceit about ordinariness as the collection's conceit itself. itself. The poem Weird Sister makes this point. Weird Sister, the black witches know that the terror is not in the moon, choreographing the dance of where ladies and the terror is not in the broom swinging around the hum of cat music, nor wild clock facing grinning, face grinning from the wall, the terror is in the plain pink at the window and the hedges moral as fire in the plain face of the white woman watching us as she beats her ordinary bread. Distinguishing the black witches from the white witches of Salem's fame happens immediately. The fear of witches allows Clifton to critique critique patriarchy as an acting terror on anything different or weird as she describes it in unknown. As the poem develops the shift away from a clear and spoken terror, which is to the terror no less imposed, but far less articulated, complicates the ideas of morality and sisterhood. Finally, the white woman's plain pink face 
or plain face, plain pink and ordinary bread is juxtaposed against the implied black woman who constitute the us in this poem upon whom the white woman gazes. The racial tension of the poem is at once subtle and intense. This balance is what Morrison had been pushing Clifton to do with Miss Anne, and it is what Clifton ultimately achieves throughout the volume as she explores the ordinary themes of love, family, and history. After publishing three books of poetry at Random House, Clifton finally completed the book of prose she had begun years earlier, Generations, a memoir. She had signed the contract for the book in April of 1969 and talked about the book with Morrison when they first met, but they decided to publish An Ordinary Woman first because Clifton did not feel ready to publish the memoir. She had talked to Clifton, had talked to Alice Mayhew about the book, and what she was hoping to accomplish, but she was unsure. Quote, it will take months because the bringing of one's insides out, especially for somebody who has made a whole life of holding very carefully her insides is some kind of hard. Also, I think that after I bring them, I shall trot them back in and hold them again. That's hard. I shall take me apart and put me back together. But you know, I can do that if I just would, end quote. Nearly five years later, with Morrison as sounding board for generations, especially Morrison's enthusiasm for the book, Clifton completed it. A few days after speaking to Clifton about the draft on the phone, Morrison wrote, Lucille, generations is so good. I do love it. What a good time I'm going to have publishing it. Morrison and June Jordan met for the first time in 1974, the same year Memphis and Peking and An Ordinary Woman were released. Jordan had already published nine books and by all accounts was a popular poet who was committed to doing the hard work of promoting her writing, unlike Chase Rabeau. But Jordan was under contract for a novel at Simon & Schuster and Jim Silberman insisted that Random House could only be Jordan's publisher if they were taking on all of her work. The initial contract negotiations stalled because of this and Morrison and Jordan's new and untested relationship began to fray before it could even unfold. This one's an internal memo where you can see Morrison writing to Jim Silberman, ultimately saying, I want very much to publish a book of poetry by June Jordan. Aside from the quality of her work, the attached sales information should remove obvious reluctance I would have about taking poetry on. Remember, she's had two books of poetry that don't do especially well, but she wants to publish June Jordan. Um, uh, Jim Silberman's response is, my reluctance is that her fiction is elsewhere. Is she a good novelist? Can we be her only poetry and fiction publisher? So while Morrison had told June Jordan that she could get a contract done in just about a week, this difficulty in terms of buying a novel from Simon & Schuster slowed the contract down. In an effort to smooth things over with the tension between the two, June Jordan writes to Morrison, quote, I am sorry that because we don't know each other well enough to accurately assess the import of an exchange or on the other hand of unexpected silence, things have come to their current resolution that I am seeking with this letter to obviate and move positively beyond, end quote. Perhaps to eliminate confusion and to make her point explicitly, Morrison laid out the facts as she saw them over four pages. Wasn't cute. Her first point was that she, not Random House, was interested in publishing June Jordan's poetry. So I received your letter and I want to address myself to your questions as quickly and clearly as possible. First of all, Random House, the people whom I must persuade to issue a contract are not all at all interested in publishing your poetry. I am. But that is itself a problem since the following is also true. And then she talks about salesmen and how they try to convince everyone that poetry doesn't move. That reality attended by other major challenges, the difficulty of placing poetry, the difference between selling juvenile books, which Jordan had done with some success, and trade books for adults, a publisher's nearly exclusive interest in, in making a profit were all problems. Morrison also took the opportunity to answer specific questions Jordan had about the contract. 
There would be no guarantees of promotion or a publication date, which Jordan asked for. Random House was interested in a multi-book contract, a book of poems, an adult book on Bessie Smith, and Jordan's novel for which the publisher would have to pay Simon & Schuster since Jordan had received an advance for that book. A strict profit-making sequence would be this, quote, first Bessie, a book on Bessie Head, second a novel, and third poetry, Morrison wrote. Your preference is just the reverse. And I can accommodate you, although it would be harder since you are the determiner of the way you work and I wouldn't meddle with that, end quote. The back and forth about the contract continued until they finally reached an agreement. Morrison claimed that her, and June Jordan, of course, um, let me just read. The back and forth about the contract continued until they finally reached an agreement, but not without first battling each other rhetorically in letters, signifying along the way. Morrison claimed that her four page letter was an attempt to be clear. Jordan took offense to its forthrightness and its pedantic tone. Morrison wrote that she thought Jordan's precise questions deserved very precise responses. After the noting that the duo had had two big misunderstandings, Morrison closed the letter saying, how's your neck? I hope you're still taking medicine. Jordan wrote back that she was still confined and did a wellness check of her own. How are you? Less harried, I hope. The contract for a book of poems and the book on Bessie Smith was finally executed and they began to work on the poems. They managed to get through that process with minor difficulties, but their working relationship ended after Morrison refused to change the title of the collection. They tentatively agreed on things that I do in the dark, but Jordan resisted that title ultimately, claiming that she thought it suggested masturbation. The friendship that could have been never was, despite their attempts to support each other outside of their connection at Random House. And that effort is related to this image that you have probably seen of a picture of what was called the sisterhood uh, members. Rather than trying one final time to make the author editor relationship work, Jordan still had the contract for the second book on Bessie Smith. Morrison handed June Jordan off to Anne Free Good and said she was limiting her time in the office to twice a week so she could finish Song of Solomon. Jordan never delivered the Bessie Smith book and Morrison was at forced to admit to Silberman that Jordan was quote, either in or near litigation concerning the publisher's efforts to get advances returned, end quote. When I spent some time in the June Jordan archives, I came across minutes from the writers planning a group they call the Sisterhood. At first I thought Morrison's absence at these meetings was rather inconspicuous. Then I thought maybe she didn't want to implicate herself because they were going to start a publishing company and she didn't want to leave Random House until what they were planning morphed from talk to reality. But when I matched the dates with the meetings and the dates with her correspondences with Jordan, the fact was Morrison was probably unlikely and so frustrated was Jordan and their communication failures that she decided not to pursue a venture that would impact her livelihood with loose friends, even if they were remarkable black women writers. What became clear to me and I hope has been clear, made clear today is the intersection of art and the archive is a rewarding if challenging one. That intersection though is one of the few places capacious enough to explore the politics of publication in such a way that we get more clarity about how a collection of elegant, well-crafted poems by an artist of international acclaim, Barbara Chase Rabot, did not sell well in terms of, or did not do well in terms of critical attention or sales. That intersection between art or the intersection of art in the archive as an instructive space also gives us insight into the role of the editor from the line editing work that produces final copy to the way editors must nurture their writer's visions, allowing voicings and silences in the work of Lucille Clifton to collide. And that intersection of art and the archive helps us to understand what happens when the singular and the collective converge. In this case, June Jordan's singular experiences with publishers and then her experience with Morrison and Random House. In the end, the best way we can hope 
or the best that we can hope for is a holy new work of art where oblivion and awareness oscillate without the fear or without any attempts to smooth out or resolve the contradictions. That kind of freedom allows us to better see and to better know more about Tony at random. Palmer, my name is Carla Gomez. I am a graduate. Range of um, subjects that more um, and you were speaking about editorship. So I was curious about the range of subjects that. Um, they, I'll look both at the titles, and I'm sorry. I'll go back to the titles and then maybe they can show it. Here we go, here. So that's just an image of like some of the books. So you have John McCluskey's, look what they've done to my song, which is fiction. And she edited Henry Dumas's fiction. Uh, Leon Forrest, Wesley Brown's Tragic Magic. So the, the least, the, the lesser known writers are like I'm having the trouble with. And of course, Tony K. Bambara, uh, Brian Woolley's Some Sweet Day. So fiction is one category. And interestingly enough, that's how I had initially had this grand plan to organize this book, didn't work out. <laughs> then Huey P. Newton. So there's that kind of radicalism, if you will. And of course, she also did Angela Davis. She does Muhammad Ali when Muhammad Ali is really shunned nationally for having thrown his Olympic medal in the pool and not going to jail because he is a conscientious objector. Um, and Boris Bitker's The Case for Black Reparations, a Yale law professor who says all of the responses to James Foreman's insistence on reparations by churches, the responsibility of white Christian churches and white Jewish churches and the ways that they have played a role in enslavement, um, he gives that talk and none of the responses are on merit. The responses are all based on like his performance. So this Yale white, white prof law professor says, here's the case that we can make. It's not slavery, it's everything after. And it, it's a tax argument because ultimately he was a tax lawyer. But she publishes that. Um, Chin Wei Zhu. Um, Ivan Van Sertima. They came before Columbus, which is like really interesting because it caused a tremendous amount of controversy. So despite the fact that he had these academic credentials, like the headlines were something like, Ruggles professor says, black man here before Columbus, maybe Abu Dhabi day instead of Columbus day or something like that. So of course now something that's very commonplace to us, like where we shifted from Columbus to indigenous people or clear awareness. So that kind of radical text, if you will. Then that next, and so that, that's Huey P. Newton. I don't know who that book is behind Huey P. Newton. I'll have to think about that. The next one is the black one is the Boris Bitker, the case of black of reparations for reparations. Then there is sexist justice. So she also has this period where she publishes white women's feminism. And then, uh, so the book right after that one, uh, the lesbian myth and then Quincy Troops, giant talk and then these poets. So the range is great, fiction, poetry, uh, short stories and the struggle with the short stories is real too, because as Tony K. Bombard made it clear, like short stories don't make money. They make money if they're placed in individual magazines, but they don't make publishers money. They build reputation. So those short stories were also um, a part of something that she was interested in doing, but she only did. And I forgot Gail Jones, who so has to be there somewhere. Yeah, and, and you know the riskiness of Gail Jones. And I'm probably forgetting somebody, but your question was not about the books, it was about the types. And so there are all types. In some instances, she was aware, I mean, she went to seek the authors, the story that we told with um, Barbara Chase Rabot, 
In other instances, she inherits the person, Lucille Clifton. Um, in other instances, a book comes across her desk, the Boris Bitker case of black reparations. He sends it to Random House. And it's a very different kind of time in reality. Like you didn't have to have an agent. You sent the thing in and it went to the mail room and somebody put it on somebody's desk to say, read this and what do you think? So she's like, oh, I think this is very interesting. Similarly, a book called the People's Medical Handbook or the People's Handbook of Medical Care. They just call her up and say, hey, we got this book. We need to help people understand how to survive during the 60s um, movement when they're tear gassing people. And it needs to be a people's handbook. Everybody doesn't have access to care. And then communes were very popular and people weren't going to hospitals in the same way. So they call and she's like, yeah, sure, I'll do it. Because she didn't have a stable of writers um, that she would have been working with had she been assistant associate editor before she makes a quick move over. It's random and the black book. Railroad, she does a book called Railroad Trains People. She does a cookbook. Yep, Creole Feast. Um, uh, big scrapbook. Yep, black book, I thought I said, but there's one more. Uh, Trains and McPherson, James Allen McPherson. But just because you're asking me this, they're not there. Plus, I'm also very centered on what I'm working on right now. Which is Tony K. Bombard. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's Albert Murray, right? No. Yeah, train whistle guitar. Nope, she didn't do that. It's something like real train people, railroad something. Cotton Club. She does a book on with James Haskins on the Cotton Club. That wasn't the one. I think I could see it, but I can't get the title quite um, out of the out of my head. No, not. I've seen a bunch in a like I've seen different people who come pretty close. But I think I'm closest. <laughs> in part because of course you know the first conversation she had Renee send me the CV, which had about 80% of the books. And so I think part of my bona fides was I was like, hey, I see this other book. Like, what's the story with this? And she's like, oh my God, I forgot about that. What else do you have? So then I was like, this book, this book. She's like, yep, yep. And then there are these mysteries where she's clearly in the archive, clearly involved. And I say, hey, we didn't ever talk about, um, what's the name of the book? We Are Everywhere, this Rhodesian gorillas, uh, a book about Rhodesian war, you know, um, they call themselves gorillas. So I can say gorillas, but it's essentially people <laughs> of like the war tactics for Rhodesia, South Africa, and she says, not my book. And that's all I can get her to say. And I'm like, yeah, but look, like, look at your memos, not my book. You got a whole folder. It's in the Toni Morrison section. What are we talking about? Not my book. And that's all I get. So I don't really know. So how you have to handle that is you let the archive tell its story and you footnote it and say, I don't know why, but she didn't claim this book. It could have been that it was published uh, in London and it's a reprint and she didn't want to count the reprint, but there are other reprints that she counts. So I don't know the story behind it. Yes. Nope, that one is the Boris Bitker. Um, she doesn't do George Jackson. Um, Blood in My Eye is at Random House, but she is not involved with the publication of it. So Random House really was a kind of leftist radical um, agency in part because the history of Random House follows the history of so much of Jewish publishing where the mainline mainstream people would not let Jewish people essentially um, be promoted to executives, top executives at the company. So they finally just in the 1920s just broke and said, we can't continue to try to like be promoted when it's clear that you're gonna shut us out every time. So then they started their own firms uh, and that's where you get the Harlem Renaissance. 
because who else do they have to publish? What are the new voices? What's the kind of edgy stuff that nobody else is touching? So the relationship between African-American literature and Jewish publishers is a very long one, a very long detailed one. And the relationship again, between black people and Jewish people, because remember it was no dogs, no Jews, no niggas. So it was um, always synergistic, but no less complicated because Charles Harris, who's editor at Random House before Toni Morrison does not fare as well as she does. When he's trying to like really push the more radical text for whatever reason, they bump heads and Harris leaves Random House. And the only memo he says, uh, the only thing in writing is Random House and I disagree about what we are going to publish. Um, so I'm leaving. And he founds the university press at Howard. I did have an opportunity to interview Harris before he transitioned and became an ancestor. And he said, oh, it was just clear, like this, it wasn't going to work. There was so much tension. Everything that I put forward, there was always an argument and everybody else was just getting their books like right away. And I was, you know, recommending these series and he had started a number of series at Doubleday and was one of the few black publishers who had gone up through the ranks. He's a part of this National Urban League program that was training people for the business aspect of publishing. So he knew how to make a determination about how much money a book was going to make. He could do the calculation. Um, did that at Doubleday, comes over to Random House, and he's actually the person who acquires Muhammad Ali. Um, but the Muhammad Ali book took so long that he was gone and <laughs> Morrison picked it up. So. I want to remind everyone that you need to try to ask your questions into the microphone so that the people par participating over Zoom can hear your questions. Yep. Um, do we have any questions from our um, audience over Zoom? Doesn't seem like it. Okay, so um, are there any questions for those of you in the room here? Thank you, Dean, I enjoyed your lecture. Um, I'm not quite clear on this, but uh, was there a moment when um, she had a relationship with Bessie Head, the writer from South Africa? I think she was living in Botswana. What happened with that? So the first book that Morrison actually publishes is Contemporary African Literature, an anthology, which was supposed to be a textbook. And Bessie Head was one of the writers. Um, whose work she included there. And it was her work, she says Africa House, which I've not been able to find a lot of evidence of. I mean, it might've been a bookstore, but she says it was a bookstore called Africa House, but it was some, some bookstore and cultural center where she began to read African writers. Um, and then anytime those African writers were in the country, she made it a point to try to engage with them. And of course it is reading the Chinua Achebe um, um, that makes her think there was something going on. She has this great clip in The Pieces I Am where she talks about there was something happening in that Chinua Achebe book, just the way that the black man strokes his wife's hair, where she thought this would never happen in a black American book. So um, because the black writer, male writer was always talking to someone else other than to her, whereas these African writers seem to be talking to her and talking to each other. So beyond that, I haven't, seen anything that doesn't mean it doesn't exist it just means like there are a limited number of rabbit holes i go down and the bestie had tony morrison rabbit hole for like a book she didn't publish because i had a whole chapter on stuff that she wanted to publish but didn't get to i had to stop myself <laughs> this is really fascinating correspondence between her and joyce ladner who was like a leading sociologist at the time who was working on a book on fannie lou hamer this book that she wanted to do with Andrew Young. And I stop, stop, stop. You can't talk about books that didn't make it. Yeah. Thank you, Dana, for a wonderful lecture. So um, interesting to hear about this, hear more anyway, about this aspect of Morrison's career. One of the things that I want to ask you about, because it became so clear when you were talking about how she edits um, that line about, take out Little Rock because mm -hmm. Little Rock makes it seem like it's the newspaper. And, you know, it, it just says so much about Morrison and how she edits. And what I am wondering is whether or not this work is showing you anything that's um, self-reflective about her own writing. Mm -hmm. um, 
and, 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 you know, even as a, a professor who grades and you have to go and say, no, this doesn't work. You know, I always say the, the real challenge for people who edit is not to know the answer, but to know the formula, you know, so that you don't just say, ah, it's awkward or something that sometimes you write in the margins and then people say, well, what do you mean? And so I just found that kind of detailed sense of what to keep and what to um, take out really instructive. So I'm just wondering whether you're finding out anything more about Morrison as a writer of books too. So I think three quick things that I think will answer. One, um, the work that she did with Gail Jones, I think helps to clarify Morrison as a writer. Uh, because, and she even says it, so the letter that she writes, like I have these manuscripts and this writer makes me green with envy. <laughs> Where she's literally thinking like, look at this incredible work that Gail Jones is doing. And so the way that she talks in writing to Jones about learning to ask the questions, I think are the questions that she was also asking herself, like as she was writing, like every so many pages, how do we move towards the things that we want to hear? How do we learn more about this, this character or learn more about this situation? So as she's doing that for writers, I think she's thinking, and I, I think we all do this as teachers, like we're like, I'm not going to write like that, <laughs> even if I don't know what I'm going to do. So I think some of that is there as well. The second thing is um, the cookbook. So some folks who do like kind of food studies talk about food in Toni Morrison. I think that has everything to do with those cookbooks because you can see the recipes and she has to figure out how to make the recipes work because all she has is a recipe. It doesn't say put this in first, put this in second, do whatever. So she's literally writing the script for the recipes of these chefs that she has gotten to contribute to um, the cookbook. And then the third one is something that I just haven't gotten around to yet and I will at some point soon. Blanche Knopf sends her, and of course she's at Knopf, which is quote unquote big random, she's at little random. So they're all like fourth floor, third floor, you know, they're all in the same building. So they're interacting with each other. But Blanche Knopf's at the summer home, writes Morrison back, and says, hey, here's this story that I think you'd be really interested in. That story sounds a lot like love, but I haven't read it yet. I haven't read it. So the book she ends up, she uh, does, it's called Irma, and I haven't read it, but it tells the story of this. There's a tiny thread that I think she pulls on in the same way that she looks at Margaret Garner and says, I wanna do something with that. I think there's something with Irma's story that she says, hmm, what happens when you're at a resort? Because Irma is the servant at a resort where she supposedly loved, you know, as this Black woman who's taking care of these multiple families, but she watches and experiences um, integration happen such that this resort that's really kind of the thing and coveted like shifts after integration. So I just had to read Irma to figure out whether or not there is actually any type of relationship. So I think that there are things that she would read as editor and say, nope, this isn't gonna work. Or a style that she would say, hmm, this is incredible. Let me think about this. Mm -hmm. So we have a question from one of our uh, Zoom audience members, Nick Wilding, who's a professor in the history department here. How did changing technologies in the period, facts, word processing, photocopying, et cetera, affect the nature of Morrison's archives? Oh, Nick, I'm so glad that Morrison left before email. <laughs> and I think about this all the time. And of course, people who do archive studies and archive theory are very clear about the challenges related to this kind of thing. But one thing that was just incredible and important is that like when this affirms archives, it's great because they will keep a copy of what was sent out. And then you got the copy of the other side of the correspondence. So you can see everything was done in carbon. The type, the hand, what happens handwriting. It gets complicated when you see something that's handwritten and you don't know whether or not that was a draft and if it ever went out or what. But fortunately, it was, she left in 84 and actually long, like four or five years before that, she was only working from home and coming in a couple of days out of the week. So it was pre-fax, word processing, photocopying. 
and a lot of typewriting. You see the differences between secretaries, which kind of burns me up sometimes. I'm like, come on, where's Janet? I need Janet, I need this memo. Like I know her, right? Or you can see like people who copy everything and you, the, literally the move with secretaries, also you see the move of what's there. But then there's the difficulty of Angela Davis, who not only lived with her when she was writing, but also went to work with her. So there's no written correspondence. Then there is um, Tony K. Bambara, who would write by herself in Atlanta. And then when it was time for a revision, that's when she would come to New York for two weeks. They would talk it out and she would say, Morrison said, you know, I would see the manuscript and I would read it and then we would talk about it. And then she said, Tony would run upstairs and in five hours, she'd come back with, here you go. Like that was the kind of mind that she had. The um, biggest amount of correspondence we see is between them with Salt Eaters where, you know, Bambara says, I don't really know what's happening with this novel. I'm sending you all these pages and you can tell me what you think. And so they, you know, are in conversation and writing there. But as long as um, they're in this proximity, that's the other missing part of the archive. That's really hard. We have a couple more questions. Um, so uh, from Josh, Josh Jackson, who is a graduate student working on beloved and US historical textbooks. Um, he asks, you mentioned Morrison was working for a small firm when she worked in the textbook department. Mm -hmm. What was that small fir firm and did she edit any textbooks? Yep, um, it was L.W. Singer, Leland W. Singer in Syracuse and Random House bought it as a part of their um, textbook expansion plan. She worked with the St. Thomas More series and there are two titles that she worked with and I can't remember either one of them, but one, um, she initially invited her thesis advisor, Robert Elias, to be the editor for. So I can't think of the title of it, but it was Singer. And from Tom Addington, do you have hey, a Thomas? Do you have a sense of what Morrison thought about her editorship, her role as editor? This talk put me in mind of Dorothy Porter Wesley's tenure at Howard. Yeah, um, I do. She was very um, enthusiastic about the editorship and enthusiastic about work being done on the editorship. Um, as I mentioned before, like um, my dissertation advisor and mentor and just very person who's very dear to me was also a very good friend of Toni Morrison. So that was Eleanor Trailer. So Dr. Trailer taught us this class on Morrison's editorship of fiction writers. Um, then I think that's when I first met Daniil at the um, Leon Forrest lecture at Northwestern. Um, and Morrison was the lecturer. It was the year after Forrest had died. And here's like a word of warning to every student or anybody who's writing anything. Like if you don't have the nerve to ask somebody to do something, do it right away. I had like this email sitting in my drafts folder for months for Leon Forrest. I had no idea Leon Forrest was dying of cancer. No idea. I had no idea that he was a perfectly pleasant person. So I've since talked to his wife, but not him. So I was like completely afraid to ask him to do it. He dies and I'm devastated. So then I go to Northwestern when I had all of these other opportunities to go to Northwestern before to talk to Leon Forrest, I end up going to this lecture that Morrison gives after Forrest dies, the Leon Forrest lecture, the first one. And we're talking after and I introduced myself and said, just, you know, I'm at Northwestern, I'm doing a postdoc, I'm working on Leon Forrest. And she was like, how'd you come to know Leon Forrest? I was like, well, you know, Eleanor Trailer taught us his life. She was like, oh my God, I bet that was delicious. <laughs> it was, I was like, it was a really delicious. She's like, well, if you do anything with it, let me know. And I thought like, Tony Morrison is offering herself to me as a resource for a book that I don't think I want to do because it's too big, but okay, I can figure this out. So. Um, she talked a lot and when I when we had the first uh, meeting or the interview in the office, um, you could just see as she talked about office like this is really important work and people don't talk about it. So she was excited. I think that she was very proud. She was incredibly proud of the work she did. She would pull books down off the shelf and say, look at this. I mean, look at this. I did this. <laughs> Particularly that contemporary African lit. So she's like flipping through, like here are all of the pictures. I had to pick this picture. Oh, I remember this. So it was also kind of, I hadn't thought about this in this way um, kind of moment. So 
Okay, and I'm what? pretty sure like the other, the other little thing is always be nice to people just because it's because, you know? I don't remember where I was staying, but I remember I had never met Danielle before in my life. And she's like, do you need a ride? And I was like, okay, yep. <laughs> and we're since like colleagues in, in one, but I was, a, I was a graduate student. I didn't know, I was a, I had just finished. I didn't understand collegiality in that way. That I didn't understand. So like Jasmine's one of my former students, like I hope that they, I hope that I have been able to model for them. This is just like how you interact with people as human beings in the world and as people who are other cultural workers and who are doing things, even at the undergraduate level, uh, at the graduate level. And so for me, people were always like, they're big people, I'm small people. <laughs> but more often than not, if you're working on the same kinds of things, people think of like, these are just people who are contributing to the field. Excellent advice, thank you. So uh, another question from our Zoom audience, Eddie Namias, he's the chair of the philosophy department here. Are you willing or able to tell us which of Morrison's novels is your favorite? Mm. Yep. Um, Song of Solomon is my favorite to teach and probably like one of the most inc like incredible ones just in a general sense. But I think Paradise is the most important. Yep. <laughs> I think what she does with Paradise just as a critique of white American nationalism is unmatched. And people still kind of sleep on Paradise. But that book is, that book is hard. The work she had to do to kind of have that pursuit of either you got to give up thinking about which character is like raced or not to do that. And also to have this critique, I just think it's just remarkable. But Song of Solomon, I'll teach over and over and over and over and over again. We have a question here in the room. I see two questions. We'll probably have to stop here because we're almost out of time. This is our last two. Okay. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Jasmine Wilson. I'm a former student of Dr. Williams. And a current, a, and, a recent, oh. yeah, that's right, and a recent. I also am a master's candidate in the African American Studies program at Clark Atlanta University, where I've successfully defended my master's thesis. Um, but this is not about me, it's about yeah. Dr. Williams. Um, Dr. Williams, when I was with you at Howard, we were in a class together where we studied some of the authors that you've shared with us today. How has this project evolved for you since that time? And what are some lessons that you've learned in the process of writing this extensive work? That's a great question. Um, I would start with what I've learned is to wait until it comes. Um, because I've been like pursuing this project in my mind in some ways for more than 20 years. And I fought for any number of reasons, like I needed to hurry up. It was everything about the kind of professionalism, the thing that I talked about, which is why I paused long enough and spent those first minutes with, here's why we haven't done this work. And this is the responsibility of scholars to say, it's okay to not smooth it out. So that's like lesson number one was wait until it shows up. Um, and it, those of you who are familiar with Tony K. Bambara as author and as writer, you know, like I still believe like so completely, let me, let me back up and preface this. Tony Morrison would say things like, my mother believed that there were things that ate socks. Cause like, how do you keep losing socks? Something in this house likes socks is what she would say as a way of explaining how beloved could be alive and dead. So let me preface that by saying, I'm not crazy. Tony K. Bambara shows up. Like Tony K. Bambara's energy is incredible. So very often I'll say, all right, are you coming today or not? <laughs> like I can't command you the way that I can command some of these other texts. Like I gotta just wait. So learning that lesson and being stuck there made me say, it's okay. You don't know what you need to know yet. It's fine that you don't know. So waiting was the first thing. The second thing that I think that I learned is Anything that is smoothed out, anything that has no contradictions, anything that just reads like, this is the story. Half of the story is on the floor somewhere. It's not all there. So that was the other thing. I was just like, I can't make this work. I can't make this, there are no neat boxes. I can't put this in this chapter. People are bleeding. Like, why didn't people just stay in one genre? Or what do, like, what do I do? So being okay with the messiness took me also a long time. Um, to accept. The third lesson, somewhat of a final, is 
transparency about the process. So almost every time I talk about it now, I talk about how this thing came to be. So the, was it 2016? The Morrison Conference on her editorship for the society at, um, in New York. Um, I think the title of that was, I, I remember doing this homage to Margaret Walker, which is how I wrote Jubilee. I, was, I did how I'm writing Tony at random because it's really important. And I've just seen something on social media where Shanna Benjamin, who wrote about Nellie McKay's life, every time she gives a talk, somebody said like, I appreciate like Shanna demystifying this process. And so that's the third thing that I, I would say I took away is that demystifying the process is as important as the process, is, process itself. And it's changed so many different ways. Oh my gosh. The organization has changed from chronological where I was really trying to do like a literary biography of um, the editorship, where the editorship was at the center. Um, early on, I had, I'm not exaggerating, like a 70 page intro that talked about the history of editorships of black text from Frederick Douglass all the way to, which is, but yeah, it's an article. It doesn't need to stay in here. But you know, and that's what I tell my students all the time. You don't need to tell me everything you know. <laughs> but at the time, <laughs> I thought I need to tell everything I know. Like I know all these. Now I know why these Jewish publishers and black writers work together. But you know, that's an article somewhere else. So that was the other thing that has changed about it. Um, this is actually <laughs> this is the first time that I've grouped these people together. In part because I just gave a lecture. Um, last week at Florida State and I was thinking, all right, that's practice. I'm gonna get it right for Plummer. And I was like, oh my God, they're streaming. I can't like do the same thing twice. So I'm gonna be embarrassed. So I had to like figure out how to order this. And so spending the week trying to figure out eh, who do I wanna talk about? Cause I didn't wanna talk about Tony K. Bambara completely because that chapter is not finished. But as I said, I had finished the interview with Barbara Chase Rubo. So that was kind of at the forefront of my mind, I had finished an interview recently with Angela Davis. And then like there, I mean, there were people like every time I email somebody and say, hey, I'm working on this project, like, are you willing to have to like, sure, okay. But that had everything to do with the way that that relation, those relationships were. The regard for the work that she did as editor um, is really important. So now the structure is more like, and the other part that really changed it was the books under contract with Harper and Collins and they wanted to read like a book that anybody would wanna pick up as opposed to an academic book. So that's the other thing. It shifted from an academic book to a kind of public facing book on scholarship. So I was telling the students um, over lunch that trying to tell a story where you're not there is really hard. You don't really like it, but you read it and then my friends and I joke, like uh, Lawrence Jackson, who does these right, like really great books. And everybody's like, man, everybody can't be Larry. And I'm like, but I want to be Larry, you know, just in terms of telling the story in a way that makes you feel like you're there, but also without it also feeling like you're making up stuff. And how do you let your voice come out instead of like all of these quotes? How do you read 20 pages of back and forth? And then between her and Barbara Tracer Boat, and then tell that story without quoting a whole lot. Because you're not like, nobody wants to just like, if it's a life and letters, everybody, people would want to read just the letters, but you also want to be able to give some color commentary to it with the other stuff that you know. So I think those are the structure in terms of organizationally. Now it is more. The only chapter that isn't directly about the editorship is one that kind of sets up who Morrison is and what might have um, really contributed to her um, ability to do the work that she's, that she's doing. But that's probably also, believe it or not, the shortest chapter. Just a quick question, Dana. Morrison has stated that she left editing when she realized she didn't have to have a day job mm -hmm. because Song of Solomon was so successful. Have you found that to be accurate or was being a mother, an editor, a teacher, she was doing a million things at one time, which I always marvel at. So what have you found? 
I think she, I, I agree with her um, statement that she had done all of those things for so long and they were all related to books. So she knew how to put the teaching in one bucket, the writing in one bucket and the editing in another bucket. I think that that was true. Um, I think, I can't remember where she said it, but um, she talks about like nobody wanting to be alone. You, you don't wanna be the only one of anything. So I think being an editor helped her to be in relationship with people in a way that fed her own writing because if she was just writing about it, so she's like, nobody wants to be the only one. And, and so somebody was asking her something like, was there ever any competition between you and one of your writers? And she's like, no, I wanted friends. <laughs> you know, I wanted other people. I didn't want to be the only one. I did have to make sure that I didn't get all of them reviewed at the same time because they'd be very different books and people would try to talk about them together. But there was something about the community of writers that was important to her. And she did a little bit of work still after she had left Random House. Uh, of course she did um, Tony K. Bombaro's These Bones Are Not My Child. Um, long after, I mean, that might've been after, but well, Paradise was out. So it was, she had worked on it for a while. She came pretty close to picking Gail Jones up again. But the tension between, it was the tension was not between Gail Jones and Morrison, it was between Gail Jones's husband and Morrison when he asked her for a sample of her work as an editor. After she had edited like three of Gail Jones's books, she's like, I'm out. I've tried everything I could to protect you, but I can't do this. So I'm trying to think of another example, but I think, I think she enjoyed the work. I think she took a, a tremendous amount of pride in creating a space for other writers. Um, and then I think she just like really enjoyed it. So if you see some of that footage of her at these press conferences or her interaction in different places, I think she's just like, yeah, I did, I did that. That was a big deal. And she was like one of so few. So, um, the only person who came anywhere close to the amount of time that she spent in publishing is Marie Brown, who is still working, but was at Doubleday at the time. Everybody else came in and out. And so Errol McDonald, who took over a lot of her list, is probably the longest standing Black editor now at, a, at, the, at the same house, because he was always, he's been at Random House since she left. Well, thank you all of you for joining today. If you have time and you feel comfortable, you are welcome to stay and continue the conversation. We have some food and beverages waiting for you outside in the lobby area, so this can continue. But please let join me in thanking Dr. Williams again for this wonderful discussion today. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.